my books that were in my classroom. So initially I was inclined, I was going to remove all of them because being a tenured teacher, there's I had so many books. And uh, when I started doing it, I was thinking about the significance of literacy and how our kids are not reading proficiently. Like right now we have 23 uh, percent of third graders reading proficiently. And I said, you know what, I can't remove those books. I asked one of my friends to come in who was a former teacher and we worked together to get the book listed so that we can put them on the website. Uh, then um, during Black History Month, I want to say uh, last year, uh, was some of the information that we wanted to share during the Black History program, I was a little bit hesitant of what we could say and what we could not say. And so that impacted uh, how we engage our students with Black history. And when you think about, we can't say CRT, but one thing I realized, you can't deny talking about our community and being honest about where we are uh, here in Memphis. So my voice is important. I can share what is going on, how it's impacting uh, my students and myself. Uh, teachers and students are the best messengers. Uh, we can provide those real world perspectives about the bills that impact our classrooms. And so basically I feel like it's important as teachers to be able to share uh, that insight and why it is important to engage students, families, uh, with honest education, uh, if students do not understand or feel the warmth of the village, it's a quote that says that they will burn the village down. And so I feel like it's very important for students to understand who they are and their identity. And so I feel that's why our voices are important. Thank you, Melissa. And one of the things that I want to pull out of the response that you just gave is when we think about the harm of these policies, Melissa talked about having to list books that she has in her classroom library. And one of the tools that policymakers who are passing this kind of legislation is using is forcing educators to do things that really add to the already significant burdens that educators face daily to overwork them, to make it such that they can't keep books in their classroom because they don't have the capacity to create a list of every single book that they have um, to list it on a website. And so what we have seen across the nation and in Tennessee in particular is educators who simply don't have the capacity to list books. And so they simply get rid of their classroom library. Even though Tennessee has passed the third grade reading retention law that says that if, if students don't pass the third grade reading test, they can be retained. We are now putting policies in place that make it really hard for our students to get access to the very books that are going to help them pass that reading retention test. And so one thing we also heard Melissa say is that educators and students are some of the best folks to go to policymakers to talk about this. And I wanna include in that, families as well, parents as well. Um, but in thinking about advocacy, Bob, I wanna direct the next question to you. Can you share with us what's been the most surprising part of adding advocate to all the things you already do as an educator? Well, I think the first thing to say is obviously as teachers, we do wear a lot of hats and we do a lot of things and it can feel like a heavy lift to add advocacy to that. Um, but I think the thing that was surprising to me, especially as I kind of began, you know, getting into this world of advocacy and, you know, talking to legislators was that there's a lot of easy entry points. So for me, I was encouraged to like write an email to a legislator. And so this is a couple of years ago. And so I wrote an email uh, to my legislator at the time. And next thing I know, he emailed me back with his personal phone number and said, call me, I want to talk about this. And so that led to like a 30 minute phone conversation um, where I got to share my perspective about the issue at hand. Uh, it was testing back then. Um, and we kind of had a back and forth, you know, we didn't necessarily ag agree on everything, but, um, I felt heard. Um, and I realized like, oh, like legislators want to talk to teachers and, and, you know, in the several years since, as I've talked to more legislators on the phone, via email, in person, I've never had a bad experience where they didn't want to hear from me as a teacher. Um, more often than not, when I tell them I'm a teacher, 
they're eager to hear from me. They want to hear from me because I think most of them will admit, especially if you you get them kind of one on one, like they know that they're not the experts in this area. And and the reality is with the legislators, you know, they, you know, that's not typically their their full time job. You know, they're they're juggling dozens of other issues, and education is just one of many complicated issues that they need to hear from the people on the front lines about. Um, and so that's one reason I'm I've become such a big advocate for teacher voice and teachers having a seat at the table. Uh, you know, legislators, board members, state board members, they need to hear um, from teachers um, because their decisions, they affect, um, you know, my profession, you know, my school, the, the students that, that I teach. And so, again, I think the biggest uh, takeaway for me has just been the willingness for them uh, to, to hear from teachers. And so I would encourage you know, if you have any interest in this, and I think all teachers should to some degree, like write an email to your legislator. And we're going to talk a little more about that later on. But like I said, there's some easy entry points and I, and it can seem intimidating. You know, they're, they're elected officials, they're legislators, but really they're just people. You know, they've gotten elected in these positions and they're trying to figure it out just as we're trying to figure out things in our own professions and jobs. And um, for the most part, they're really willing to listen and, and hear the perspective of a teacher. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, would any of the other pa other panelists like to add on to what Bob just shared? I agree, and I would like to add that oftentimes when legislators put things in place, they don't really consider the outcome it could have, right? And so, since we're directly in the trenches, since we're with their with you know with our children, we're able to see precisely what that. Um, legislation is done, the impact it's had, and they don't see that until an adverse um, reaction occurs. And so I think it's important that we shift the narrative, we own our profession, and we let those people that have these political powers um, know, okay, here's the implication of what you're trying to do. Here's one of the adverse reactions that it, that could, it could possibly have. Here is what this is going to look like in my classroom. I don't think people really, really consider that because you said it best, they're not in education. Oftentimes they're business people or from a different profession. But I think that it's important that we make sure that we are putting the right people in the right place at the right time because it's not about D, it's not about R, it's about E. Somebody from TEA said that, and I stand on that. I feel like we just need to think about what's best for children, and we can't do that if we're not a part of that decision-making process. Thank you, Nichelle. And to that point, that is exactly why we created the Voices for Honest Education space, because as an advocate, as an attorney, what we found is that there are no better people to speak to what is needed in education than educators. And what better way to make sure that educators have a seat at the table to have these conversations than to raise up educators as advocate. It is my opinion that if you are an educator, by necessity, you must also become an advocate. We are seeing attacks on education um, as a profession in so many different ways. And I wanna call everyone who is an educator on here, or if you've ever had a teacher that you love, if you have children who are taught by teachers, I want to encourage you to become an advocate as well. We must take back the education profession from people who are not educators, from people who have not been trained in what is best for kids. And so thank you, Bob and Nichelda. Nichelda, I want to continue with you. You've got the next question as well. You already spoke to this a little bit, but can you share more about why you think it's important for educators to add their voices to conversations about education policy? Absolutely. So we have valuable firsthand knowledge and experience about teaching and learning, right? And so because we have these experiences, we have to actively engage and participate in conversations about education policy. Like we must do that. Our expertise adds valuable insights that help legislators see the implications of the things that they're trying to um, enforce. We work directly with students. We understand how these policies affect teaching and learning. We know what the outcomes are gonna look like, which support academic success. And since we have the um, capacity to discuss some of the obstacles or consequences that are dealing with these policies, I think it's important that we make sure that we voice these to policymakers, right? And so we have to be the people that advocate for our students. We have to be the people that adv uh, advocate for our colleagues because we're right there in the trenches with them. 
And when we participate, we can articulate, we can fight for resources, we can fight for support, and we can fight for policies that make sense. Fight for policies that make sense. And there are several um, organizations that you can be a part of to do this. I see a couple of my advocacy colleagues on the line today. Thank you guys so much for showing up in this space. Um, we have representation from the United Education Association of Shelby County, which is our local um our local teachers association. We have a representation from the TEA. I see you guys in the room. Thank you guys so much for joining because we are the ones that have to make sure that we take our profession back and put policy and procedures in place that make sense and work best for us. Thank you, Nishilda. One thing I want to add to this, just to, to ground us in the reality of this is when I was in the classroom, this is one of the things that really drove me into education policy. I remember when I was teaching in my classroom in South Memphis, um, the Obamas were in the administration at the time. I love the Obamas. But I remember in Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, there was a policy that passed that limited because we were trying to address um, childhood obesity. There was a policy that was passed that limited how much food students would get in their school lunches. And I remember I had um, one of our basketball players in my class and it was after lunch and he was hungry because they'd reduced the size of, of meal portions. And he was in my classroom crying because school was the only place where he could get his food and he had not had enough to eat and he was hungry. And so when we think about exactly what we've heard everyone so far talk about the true impact, the true role of educators in engaging in advocacy, that right there is a concrete example of why we need educators at the table to say, yes, childhood obesity might be a problem, but we've got to think about also our kids who don't have access to enough food and how these policies are going to impact them as well. And so for that, we need educators who are in the classroom, who are in the trenches, who are working with our students daily so that we can have policies that are equitable in those ways. I am now going to turn to Benidra for our next question. Benidra, can you share a little bit about some of the challenges you faced or concerns you had about adding your voice to ed policy conversations in Tennessee? Can you also speak to us a little bit about how you overcame those concerns and what you would say to others who have similar concerns? Because Tennessee could be a hard and potentially scary place to engage in policy. We've seen what happens in the state legislature. So Benidra, how did you overcome those fears? Well, for me, this is a new body of work. So I can honestly say, I don't know if it's just me, but um, if you, you know, never done something before, it's a little scary here and there. So, um, that's kind of where I was. I had just kind of finished up uh, some coursework for uh, leadership and policy studies. So I was like, okay, well, let me try to get my feet a little wet, you know, and in doing this. But when I was first approached with this, um, my initial concern was how honest could I be, you know, about um, without the threat of you know, saying something or doing something where I would lose my job. So um, I was kind of concerned that if I made too much noise about certain deals, that I could jeopardize something that I've worked so hard for. So I remember just kind of really thinking about that. And I was uh, in my truck on my lunch break. And I was just kind of saying to myself, maybe I shouldn't do this because I don't want to, you know, jeopardize anything. So I, um, uh, contacted Ms. Washington, um, which is another one of the representatives that uh, we work with. And I just kind of told her, I said, you know, look, I, I said, I'm a, I'm a little hesitant about doing this because um, I just don't know where, where things would go if I say something wrong. And I can remember you know, we all know uh, Miss Washington, Monica, she's very firm with, you know, the way that she says things. And she was like, look, Benidra, you have freedom of voice. Okay. And no one can take that from you. And, you know, we kind of had a long conversation about that and how, when I am writing or saying something, then I just have to make sure that I let the people know that this is how I feel and not, it does not represent who I work for because just because I work for that does not, you know, for Smith Shelby County School, doesn't mean I always agree with some of the things that are coming down the pike in Tennessee. So I had to just kind of know, I can't 
showing my own voice. I can't, you know, close my own mouth just because um, I am afraid I have to step up. So that was my biggest concern and how I overcame that was just having that simple uh, conversation and learning, okay, there are several things that I can do. And I always have to be outside, you know, you know, uh, marching and pulled it. I could write letters, <laughs> you know, I could do op eds and those type of things. So my thing to, to people that want to be heard, just know that you have a voice and it's okay for you to use it. You don't have to worry because our ideas and, and backgrounds and doesn't always align with where we work. So we have to make sure that we speak it and make sure that we don't allow anyone to, to close our mouths. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Benidra. Anything that anyone else wants to add to that? What were some of the fears that any of you had coming into this work? Thinking about Broadly, Tennessee, and we saw the removal of the two Justins, Justin um, Pearson and Justin, oh, I... This lot, the other Justin's last name is escaping me right now. If anyone's got it, you can drop it in the chat for me. Um, but, and we also saw just the removal of parents after the Covenant school shooting from um, the legislature as they were pushing back. How did you overcome some of those concerns working in a state like Tennessee? I think that one important thing that is critical when doing this work, because there's always that fear of someone taking your words and making it negative when you have positive intent, right? And so when you're in a space with like-minded individuals, you learn strategy. And it's important that we target our talk when we are presenting information, right? Because we don't want to put ourselves at risk as it's our livelihood. And so I think the, the most important thing about advocacy work, you don't have to be on the front lines all the time. You can do things in the background, but if you so choose, even in the background, if you're writing an op-ed, you want to make sure that you're using the appropriate language. If you are doing a forum such as this, you want to make sure you have the appropriate talking points, you're sticking to the facts, and that you're not trying to sway a person. Of course, you want them to you know, hear what you're saying and then base that um, their decision-making process is based on what you're saying, the factual information. But you want to make sure that you're sticking to the fact that you're using appropriate language and that you're confidently able to speak to whatever it is you're speaking to. Uh, and I would say it's important to think about how you can get trained to do the work so that you can be solution-oriented. Because if you see a problem, you must be able to share a solution. And what I deal with legislators in different positions, it's important to know who they are as individuals so you can have some common ground, right? Because some things you're not going to agree with. And some things you can find that you can agree with them if you research them enough. And so... For those who want to try this work, I would say look at places like Ed Trust. Uh, if you're active in the union, start going to some of those trainings. Listen to those experts. But do know that you are doing the work. You are on the front lines. It is important for you to be heard and seen because you represent the students our most precious gems. And if we do not get this right, we will not have a future. They will not have a future. So you cannot be fearful because when, and it's okay to be a little afraid, right? To tackle giants, it's okay. But if you go in knowing your purpose and why you are there and that you're advocating for the profession that you love, this is a career for me, not a job. I went to school for it. I love it. And I love my kids. So if you take that passion with you, you get to the heart of things and then they will listen because they sometimes are doing things just to follow, right? Just to, I've seen big TVs in DC where they're looking at themselves on TV and they're saying, we want to dismantle public education. They're like, Melissa, I know you may not agree with it. And I say, I don't. I said, let's talk about it. And I sit eye level with them to let them know, hey, I have something to say just like you have something to say. 
and they tend to open up. We may not agree, <laughs> but I, I do want you to know that you need to uh, do this work and advocate whether is uh, you can do it in multiple ways. And we'll continue to talk about that this evening. And Benitra, I'm so proud of you for being willing to use your voice. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for those responses. And thank you to Sharon, Justin Jones as the other representative who was removed. But again, the people's voices are louder. Uh, both Justin Jones and Justin Pearson were both reinstated. And so again, that just goes to show you the power of advocacy. Thinking about the power of advocacy, Bob, next question is for you. Can you share with us some easy first steps that educators and others who are interested in advocacy can take to start their advocacy journey and begin to take back education to make it what is best for our kids? Certainly. I think two first steps that are critical is one, you got to be informed. And so that means, you know, Try to, you know, Chalkbeat's got some great newsletters, uh, the 74 million, you know, find some education news sites and just start following the news. Like what is happening in education, especially in our state? Um, Chalkbeat's got a Tennessee specific newsletter. I get in my, in my inbox every single day and they do a good job of surfacing some of these issues. So step one is really just got to find out what is going on. Um, EdTrust, um, Tennessee Alliance for Equity Education, they put out some newsletters as well that highlight, you know, bills like we've talked about uh, in this webinar. And so that's kind of the first step um, is to just be informed. And, you know, you may have an issue, you know, maybe it's that third grade literacy retention bill that kind of got you fired up. You know, you may have an issue that's got you interested in this. So the next step would be, I'm going to drop this in the chat. There is a tool on the Tennessee state government website where you can type in your address and it will tell you who your state rep is and who your state senator is. Um, those are your elected officials. If you live in their district, you are their constituent, and they should want to hear from you just because of that fact. Um, and then you add on the fact that you're a teacher, they got two reasons they need to listen to you. Um, and so uh, also, if your school is in a different district, I think you can reach out to that rep as well. You know, my school is in a different district than where I live, and so I've reached out to both my school rep and my my you know, where I live rep, um, to just about ed policy issues. And then I would just send them an email, um, kind of introduce yourself. Maybe if you've got that issue that you feel strongly about, share your perspective on that. Um, they may respond. Um, they may not, but the reality is they have staffers that read all those emails, or if you call and leave a message, they jot down, you know, how many, uh, messages for this policy or against it, did they get? That's one way they kind of gauge the public's, um, view of things. And the reality is, as I've heard it, you know, oftentimes the most, you know, maybe frustrated, angry, upset people are the ones that are calling and emailing. And so a lot of times they will think that small kind of loud minority is what everybody thinks, but it's not because most of us are just doing our jobs in our classroom every day. We maybe don't think we have time to do this. And so they don't hear from us, but they need to. And so I would just say that first step is send that email, you know, make a phone call, leave a voicemail with them. Um, and then if you do have some back and forth, you know, try to build that relationship, make it something that you reach out every once in a while when there's an issue, because what can happen, and I've, you know, I've begun to develop this a little bit, but I've heard other uh, teacher advocates that have done this is, you know, you can kind of get an end with the legislator, they'll want to hear your perspective when education issues come up. Um, and that can be a really powerful way to amplify your voice as a teacher. And then uh, the other piece I'll say is if you get a chance to go to like a day on the hill, or go to Nashville and meet in person. Like you can, if you wanted to, you could drive to Nashville and schedule a meeting and go meet with them as as the constituent, as their constituent. Um, but I think day on the hill opportunities are really powerful. TEA does one every year. Tennessee Alliance for Equity and Education does one. There's a lot of organizations that will do them, um, and I highly encourage to to go have that meeting with them in their office, it can be intimidating. And so the good thing is if you go with some of these organizations, they will do some training. But the reality is it's just a conversation. You know, you can just sit in there and tell your story of, of your school and your classroom and your students and the kinds of policies that affect you and your students. Um, because again, that is the perspective that these legislators need to hear. They need to hear these on the ground stories of what's really going on. What are the implications of that third grade retention law in reality? A lot of times, as we mentioned, there's a lot of unintended consequences that they don't foresee, but we as the teachers often do see them. And so they need to hear that from us. So those are some easy things. Find out who they are, 
send an email or a phone call. If you get a chance, try to go meet with them in person. Invite them to your school even. You know, those would be some things, some first steps you could think about doing. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, we've also got a great letter. And if we don't drop it in the chat here, we will send it out to everyone who registered via email. Um, Nichelle drafted a letter that you can send to your legislator using that link that Bob just shared. And thank you, Bob, for dropping that link. It is a really easy way to take that first step to making sure your voice is heard. And so we've got the letter already drafted for you. There's one little part in there where you can add your personal story and your why for why you want um, the legislators to do um, whatever it is that you want them to do regarding education equity, and you can send that off to them um, and make sure that your voice is added to these conversations. So like Bob said, it can be really intimidating initially thinking about how to engage with legislators, but it is their job to listen to you. That is what they are there to do. So Melissa, the next question is for you. Can you share a little bit um, what your experience has been reaching out to and talking with legislators in Tennessee? Yes. So I have talked to my state legislators uh, in different ways. So at the in D.C., Tennessee. And so before I visit a legislator, and I mentioned it before, I'm going to review their bio and website. I'm going to find something of interest that we could talk about. Because I can remember uh, talking to Senator Lamar Alexander when they was going to end the Title II. And he loves football. And, and I'm going to say this, Natasha, when, when you are like a state teacher of the year or and they know you're coming, they're going to want to take pictures, right? And... They're going to try to get you in a way you take the pictures and then they're gone. <laughs> and so you really don't get your message across. So that's what I learned the first time I engaged with them. So now what I will do, I will make sure I'm standing up. When they come in, I greet them. <laughs> I, I share some different things uh, with them. I have my business card in place so that we can uh, keep the conversation going, letting them know that I'm here to support them. And so I have found out that being well prepared and willing to engage in constructive dialogue goes a long way. So it's important to remember that legislators have a multitude of issues in particular coming to them. I mean, right after another instance, when you have that down here, so you have to be clear, concise, and quick. It's like an elevator pitch. You have to say what you want quickly. And sometimes we don't meet with them. It could be uh, the policy writers who get the information to those legislators. So I want to say that even though I've had fear in the beginning of my career, and I felt like some of them were not approachable, you see these things and you feel, oh my God, how's this experience is going to be for me? But actually, I have been fortunate as I have gotten more training from the union, from fellowships, from Voices of Honest Educators, you know, the work that we have done, uh, Natasha, uh, leading this work. I have uh, felt welcome sometimes in instances when I felt like I wasn't going to be welcome because we had different opinions. And so when I listen to them. I can remember with Bob when we did our day on the hill in Nashville. And I think it was uh Chris Todd. Is that right, uh Bob? And we were a little hesitant. And we was like, this may not be <laughs> going well. But we sat down, we listened to him. He talked about his niece being a teacher and how she quit because she had a bad experience. And I told him I could relate to it, being a new teacher and having classroom management, but you have to have that support. And then he talked about, well, the behavior, and he felt uh, how certain things need to happen to make sure that kids could act a certain way. And I was like, hey, we need to support the kids. So imagine if kids are always getting in trouble. We're always taking and removing things from them. Then when are they going to get the sugar, the sweet uh, side of educators truly educating them. And so it changed the di dynamics. And I remember giving him a quote. I said, you know, it said, take a village to raise a child. But if 
the village does not take care of the kids, we will feel their warmth. And so in a negative way, they will burn the village down or something, how it goes that way. And so he was like, hmm. And so Bob can contest, it just went a different uh, way. And so I've had good experience with uh, Down the Hill at the state and national level. It just give us the opportunity as educators to come together. I know some uh, sometimes you want to come in a small group because sometimes if it's a lot of people, it's like you can say, hear them saying, Cold Red, here come this group, here come that group. So they shut down uh, for some particular reason, even though we feel like uh, you're strong in numbers, but in some cases, it's very intimidated to those uh, policymakers. Um, but what I like talking to them, I can really share the reality of my classroom. I could talk to them about almost putting uh, taking my books out of my classroom. And he was like, why would you do that? I said, because you want me to list hundreds of books that I have collected. More work uh, for me to do as an educator when I have to do other things. And he was like, oh, that, that doesn't make sense. So just being able to share those experience, how I feel as an educator, even being a black teacher saying, I feel like I can't teach my kids about my community. And they thinking, mm, you can't teach about your community. You gotta use the right words uh, so that they can understand. And so, um, and uh, with Benicia was some of her, uh, with saying that earlier about being afraid, you can do things collectively as educators. You can write, write an op-ed together. You don't have to just put yourself out there. You can write a letter and several people uh, can sign that letter. So I'm going to stop. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you for that response, Melissa. And I just want to echo what Melissa was saying about um, educators want to hear from teachers. They genuinely do. And I also want to echo, they will want to take pictures with you because they'll want to put on their social media. I had a conversation with this teacher. And so make sure that you uh, get that picture as well, but make sure that they listen to you also. Invite them to take a picture with you as you're sharing your story. Um, there is a lot of power in being an educator and going into these spaces where your voices are desired. Um, and I also just want to echo what Melissa said about understanding what is going to make that legislator tick, what are the things that they care about. Finding common ground is a really awesome way to have a conversation with anybody. If you're talking to a parent who is concerned about the curriculum in your classroom, anyone who has concerns about equity, finding that common ground, starting with shared values rather than from a place of, of pushback or confrontation is always going to be the best way to have these conversations. It might feel intimidating the first time you do it, but to Bob's point, they're just people and it's just a conversation. And so... We're going to move on to our next question again. If you've got any questions or comments, feel free to drop those in the chat. We will have a Q&A at the end where we'll answer any questions that were put in the chat. But I am going to give this question to first Benidra and then Nishelda. Can you both share what your hope is for students in Tennessee and how you believe adv advocacy can help achieve this vision? All right, so my hope is that students are afforded the opportunity to understand and appreciate different cultures to assist with preparing them for the globalized world and workforce. I also hope that by expressing, well, exposing students to diverse cultures, it can help them become aware of their own biases and assumptions which can ultimately lead to them being, be you know, having better character development or better being better people. So I feel that being an advocate for bills that are being made behind closed doors, or maybe, you know, some of them are, you know, open doors that deny students the right to an honest education in which all students deserve will first uh, make community leaders, stakeholders, educators. You know, we have a lot of college students out there uh, making a lot of noise about different things now, which I'm so happy to see. Um, parents, you know, this will make them more aware about changes that are being pushed into the schools. And the more ears that hear the message will hopefully result 
in more um, advocators and the more people that are advocating, the more the message is getting out. So that is, you know, what how I feel about um, how I think that advocacy, advocating can help achieve the vision. Thanks, Benidra. Michelle, the same question. That was so good. I'm just going to touch and agree with Benidra. <laughs> but seriously, my hope for Tennessee students is my hope for all students. Um, the goal is for students to receive a high quality education, which allows for them to be productive citizens. Um, this includes equitable opportunities, um, inclusive and supportive learning environments, a love for learning, a passion for learning. And I think that advocacy plays a critical role in how that looks for students. I really believe that. And I think that if we advocate for positive changes, then we'll see more improved outcomes for the, the people that we, the students we support. And so I just want stu students to be able to be critical thinkers, to be conversationalists, to be able to articulate their needs and their experiences so they can be successful. Thanks, Nichelle. And because we've still got a little bit of time before we move into Q&A and again for our attendees, if you've got any questions, anything that you're wondering about what is happening in Tennessee, or if you're wondering ways that you can engage in advocacy, feel free to go ahead and drop those in the chat and we will get to them. But Melissa, I'm going to come to you with the same question. What is your hope for students in Tennessee and how do you believe advocacy can help achieve that? I want to say I am so passionate about education. And I know that teachers we are the frontline workers. We have the closest touch to the bodies in those classrooms. And so when I think about what I hope uh, for Tennessee students, I hope that they feel valued, heard, seen, and loved, and that they know that they had educators that wanted to advocate for them because they are the futures. They are the dreamers and the gatekeepers of this country. And I want us to know that we can do it together. Is this work hard? Yes, it is. But are you made for it? You are made for this work. And so if I know you're here this evening, that you love this profession. You love the students that enter our doors each and every day. And so I want you to know that this work is important because if we do not advocate for it, then the numbers will continue to slip away. There will be bigger gaps and we will not have those future doctors, lawyers, teachers that we dream about. So let's get this right. Let them know that we advocated for them for their future. Thank you, Melissa. I felt some church right there. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> Bob, same question. What is your hope for students in Tennessee and how do you believe advocacy can help us achieve that? You know, I'm a high school teacher and so I teach mainly juniors and seniors. And so I'm always thinking about the fact that they're about to step out into adulthood, into the real world, you know, college, career, some joining the military. And I want them to be ready for that. And they are stepping out into a very complex diverse, globally connected world, and they need to have an education that prepares them for now, that, not something that's going to kind of restrict what they can learn about or the types of perspectives they can hear about. And so that's one thing that drives me in this work is I want, I want my own children to receive an education that is just kind of full orbed and they're going to be critical thinkers and they're going to be able to understand and be prepared for this world that they're they're moving into. And I think advocacy has that that role to play because again you know we as teachers as, as we've all said we're on the front lines and the, the people at the decision making table at the levers of power oftentimes they don't know what's going on in our classrooms what our students really need to be successful and so that's where us speaking up telling our stories uh, sharing our perspective is so key and one thing you know we've talked about in some of our other meetings is when it comes to advocacy stories are where the power is. You know, we could go at a legislator with a lot of facts and figures and data points. And I know we can all talk about assessment data and stuff like that. But the reality is 
sharing these personal stories about this particular student and the challenges that this policy has created for them and their family, you know, or this family, you know, how this policy could have helped them are the things that's going to move the needle. And so that's why I'm passionate about that. There's so many stories that need to be heard by the people sitting at the at the table making the decisions. And that's where teachers have a real opportunity to step up and share those things. Thank you, Bob, and thank you to all of you for this work that you do. I want to engage our audience right now. I don't see any questions in the chat, but after everything you heard, I hope you are moved to take action. I hope you are moved to use that link that Bob shared, and hopefully use the letter that Nichelle wrote that we'll be sending out via email and send a, a letter to your legislator asking them to do better on behalf of kids. And so what I wanna do is I wanna ask everyone who is on right now to think about one student you wanna do this for, one child who you wanna make sure that they get the education they deserve, one child who you want to advocate on behalf of. And I want you to just drop that kid's first name in the chat. Just gonna take 30 seconds. Think about that one kid who you know needs policies to do better for them. Who are you going to do this for? And just drop their name in the chat. These are the ones that we do this for. All these students, Christian, Presley, see Mario, Keelan, Linkson in London, Mario, Nigel. These are the ones that we do this work for. And so until education policy in Tennessee does right by these kids, we will continue to fight. We will continue to advocate. We will continue to say this is not good enough. It is not acceptable. You will hear us and you will do what is best for these kids. And so... Again, we will send out resources via email. Thank you for registering. Thank you for joining us for this conversation this evening. Um, please go out and um, advocate. Even if you don't talk to a legislator, share with someone else, share with another teacher the importance of advocacy. That's another important part of this as well as just raising awareness and letting others know that they can also elevate their voices. And so have a good evening, everyone. Um, we thank you for joining us and we hope that you go out and elevate your voice to make a change. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.